What if the secret to winning the battle for sexual purity is understanding God's grace in a whole new way? And what if you could experience real freedom from temptation by fully trusting in God's power to help you? My guest, Emile Zwayne, is the president of Living Waters, executive producer and co-host of the Way of the Master TV program and co-host of the National Bible Bee Game Show. How cool is that? Emile, thank you for joining me today. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. After that amazing introduction, I can't wait to hear myself speak today. You know, that was <laughs> <laughs> quite the intro. Nancy, thank you so much for having me on. You know, it's such a delight. And the fact that you're willing to take on a subject like this. Not many are. Understandably, it's not a comfortable one, but uh, it's high time that we start addressing it because there's a serious problem going on today within the church amongst Christians. And uh, I'm I'm so blessed that you mentioned grace as well. That That's also a unique angle and I'm so excited to talk about this with you today. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for coming. And I know you're a busy guy with everything you got going on, especially that Bible bee thing. Holy yeah. cow. <laughs> Getting ready for that here coming up soon. It's it's a thrill. You know, these young people, some of them, the senior level at least, have memorized a thousand verses over the course of a summer. And then they stand on a stage and compete. I think the grand prize is like $50,000. Wow. And uh, it's, it's a pretty big deal. So I'm excited, honored to be a part of it. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, let, let's jump in. You know, you were talking about the spiritual battles men face. So you say, sadly, within the church today, men are impacted by a lack of understanding of what manhood is really all about. And so what do you mm -hmm. mean by that? Yeah, well, you know, the title of the book is Fight Like a Man, as you said, a bold biblical battle plan for personal purity. And Nancy, you know that we're living in a day and age where people can't even define what a man is, right? We saw a Supreme Court justice nominee not be able to tell us what a woman is, which is st it just still blows my mind. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, there is a, a, a big problem in that regard and that men don't really understand what it means to be a real man. And I opened the book up with a story of a war hero named John Bathalone back in World War II. And, you know, when I talk about being a real man, I'm not talking necessarily about being masculine and, and athletic and deep voiced and thick bearded. That all can be true. But real manhood entails courage, character, commitment, integrity, a willingness to sacrifice and lay one's life down for others. And that's what's lacking in manhood today. You know, I often uh, challenge men. I say, look, you know, if someone came and pulled their fist back and was about to pop your wife in the face or held a gun to your family and was about to pull the trigger, would you not jump in front of them and absorb that blow or take that bullet and then fight to defend them? Mm -hmm. Every man says, oh, of course I would. And yet men are not willing to fight in the area of sexual purity to defend their wife, children, their loved ones, the testimony of the gospel, right, mm -hmm. as believers. And so... That, that's what I mean when I say fight like a man, be willing to have that courage, commitment, integrity, that willingness to sacrifice and lay your life down as you fight for purity, because it can be done as you referenced through the grace of God. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just have to say this, that, you know, men's rights have been taken away from them, too. So they mm. kind of feel like that manhood part of them is taken away through over time in the last, like, I would say, maybe 30 years or so. Yeah, like really putting men down. Oh, and 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 just, yeah. Absolutely. You know, I call it the Homer Simpson syndrome. You remember the Simpsons? You know, Absolutely. Homer was like the, the town idiot. Even the kids, oh, dad, you know, made doubt to be the buffoon. It's weird because it almost seems, Nancy, like that has been an intentional agenda on the part of the world. I think it's demonically influenced because mm -hmm. as men go, so goes the family, so goes society. God has designed men to be leaders. He's designed them to have influence and impact, and especially on their family, especially on their children. And so men ha have almost been brainwashed into marching to the world's drumbeat in that regard. And it's absolutely mm -hmm. tragic. It's high mm -hmm. time that we recognize, no, God has called us as men to stand up and to lead. And look, when you're living in sexual immorality, you're not going to lead and no one's mm -hmm. going to want to follow you, right? Yeah. Because yeah. you don't sense that that freedom and that power and that strength to do so. And so there are a lot of ramifications that people don't realize when it comes to the uh, the, the repercussions of living in sexual immorality and impurity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Nancy, today uh, it's so accessible and that's a big part of the problem. 
Mm-hmm. You know, when I was a kid, you needed to have a friend whose dad had a stash and he'd sneak a magazine, you'd look at it, or it had to be, you know, a, a video that a friend happened to have or whatever. But now at the click of a button, there's access to what feels like trillions of images out there. And it's mm-hmm. not just you have to go and sit down at a computer and access it. <laughs> we have these little things called cell phones and wherever we're at, they can be accessed. And so that has played a part in it. Of course, the heart is at the center of it, our fallen sinful nature. But yes. but there's that accessibility, which has increased perversion, uh, which has caused men to become enslaved to this. And they need mm-hmm. to know today there is hope through mm-hmm. Christ. They can be set free. There's no question about it. Absolutely. And so how does the gospel-centered grace help men overcome temptation? Yeah. I can't help but smile when when I hear that term, gospel-centered grace. You know, Nancy, oftentimes when we think of the gospel, I think by default, and rightly so, our minds go immediately to the gospel being the instrument through which people are saved. And of course Mm -hmm. it is. But it's so much more than that. The gospel is really the treasure house of spiritual riches that touches every aspect of our lives. It, it's the, it's really the treasure house from which we live as believers. When we recognize the, the power that's available to us through what Christ did through his death and resurrection, which is the heart of the gospel, mm-hmm. which is that he has set us free, that we're no longer slaves of sin, that we now have the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwelling inside of us, that he's given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That is second Peter tells us he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Mm-hmm. And so when when you consider all of that and, and all of the benefits that relate to that, you start to recognize, wow, through the power of the gospel and all that it entails, I can have freedom and victory. And what I try to do in the book is I try to give men a battle plan, right? Because the problem is, is that a lot of men have what I call a peacetime mentality, when in reality, they need to have a wartime mentality as they're battling sexual sin. So, I mean, can you imagine a soldier being deceived and deluded into thinking that he's on a luxury cruise ship heading for the shores of Bora Bora to an exotic resort, when in reality, he's on a Higgins boat heading for the shores of World War II Normandy. I mean, Mm. imagine this guy. He's going to be sauntering off the Higgins boat in the midst of the theater of war, clad in a bathrobe, Mm -hmm. some fluffy slippers with a remote control in his hand, and he's going to get smoked. Mm -hmm. And so you got guys going, oh, I don't know. It's just so hard. It's difficult. They're out there, you know, again, just haphazard, like living it up in a luxury resort when they're in the midst of war and they're not prepared for it. Mm -hmm. And you think of what we prepare. We prepare for everything in life. We prepare for our education. We prepare for our careers. We prepare for our weddings. We prepare for our retirements. We even prepare for our vacations. And yet it comes to this massive battle and we're not preparing ourselves. And so in the book, I give men ways to prepare themselves. And the book is, is it's really simple. It's four basic parts. Uh, and I deal with our main enemies because we have to know our enemies. We have to know their strategy against us. And then we have to have a counterattack against them. And so part one is the devil. Part two is the flesh. Part three is the world. And part four is what I call the six C's to succeed. And this is where I get hyper practical. And I give men things to, to memorize, to internalize, to meditate on so that they're ready beforehand. Mm-hmm. And they're ready in the midst of the battle, and they're able to find victory through the Lord. That's wonderful. You know, if if you've just joined us, this is the book we're talking about. You know, Fight Like a Man, a bold biblical battle plan for personal purity. And so what scriptures can help guide the fight for purity? Yeah. Well, you know, we go into, for example, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 8, where we're told that, uh, you know, that this is the will of God, that you, you would have, you would walk in sexual purity, that, that, that you would be a, a person who understands that the enemy is coming against us to defeat us. And we need to walk in that victory. Uh, mm-hmm. First Corinthians six eighteen it talks about how every sin that a man commits, he commits outside of his body, but he who commits sexual morality sins against his own body, which means that sexual sin is set aside as a distinct sin that mm-hmm. that that has serious repercussions. As Christians oftentimes will say, oh, you know, sin is sin. Well, yeah, sin is sin in terms of it being a violation of God's law or God's standards, but not all sin is sin 
equally in terms of its repercussions and its egregiousness and its mm. effects, right? I mean, if you ask me to help you move, move house, Nancy, and I say, oh, you know what? I'm busy this weekend. And I lie to you. That's, that's a sin. It's serious and it's inexcusable. But mm. if, if I go and I murder your entire family, I think mm. there's a difference in that regard. And scripture is mm. telling us there, there is a seriousness to sexual immorality. And we have to be aware of that. And then you have, you know, Galatians 5, uh, where, where we're told that uh, 16 through 26, that we're to walk in the spirit and we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And in the book where I talk about the, the, uh, the flesh, I talk about how the, the way that we counter the flesh is to walk in the spirit, which means to be controlled or governed by the spirit. Mm-hmm. And, and then we see all the fruit of the spirit and the fruit of the flesh. And the way we get governed by the spirit is by becoming eternally minded, setting our minds on the things above rather than the earthly temporal things like the pleasures we want to indulge in. And then we, we engage ourselves in the things that the spirit of God is engaged in, which mm-hmm. are the word, prayer, fellowship, evangelism. And as we're doing that, we're walking in the spirit. We will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so those are just some, some of the things from God's word that can help us. And then, you know, how can a young man keep his way pure? Psalm 119, by keeping it according to your word, your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. God's word, again, plays a pivotal role in that as well. Mm -hmm. Well, it's so important. You know, it's really the hardest thing in the world, right? For men to keep that purity. But we know that that's something that God wants us to do to save ourselves, right? For that right person. And also when you're going, when you're walking this path of, of being tempted, of going, wanting to, to go with the flesh, one thing that you can do is you can always pray for strength. Because I know Absolutely. that strength is one of those things that God will give you. I mean, just lately, not having anything to do with the purity, but just something that I had to overcome. I was asking for strength. And I saw, I saw that God gave it to me. So God will give you an abundance if you ask, right? Oh. Absolutely. I'm so glad you, you brought that out. And that's one of the things I talk about in the book as well is, is the importance of prayer in our battle. You know, our, our verbiage gives us a way in terms of, of what we really believe in our hearts and minds. And, and, you know, some of it is semantics, but in one sense, it does affect, I mean, we, we say, oh, I guess all I can do is pray. I guess all we can do now is pray. Excuse me? Uh, we should be saying the most we can do is pray. It, it, prayer has become like the last resort. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. oh, we've done everything we could. Now, I guess we we might want to trust God or something. Right? It's like, yeah. wait, you mean all we can do is talk to the omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent God of the universe who loved us so much that he paid the highest price ever paid for anything ever purchased in the history of the universe when he shed his blood on the cross to make us is. Yeah, uh, yeah, I guess all we can do is talk to him. Who tells us what? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask and he'll, he'll give generously and without reproach, James tells us. Mm-hmm. Um, do I lack wisdom uh, a little bit? I think, do I need guidance direction? Do I, Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. Right. And yet we don't. And, uh, and, and, and so that is a big part of the problem. And that is really symptomatic of a heart that isn't close to the Lord. We don't have an intimate close walk with him. And that's a big part of finding victory in the battle. We need to be close to God. We need to have a vibrant devotional life where, where the Lord is center uh, in our, our lives. And when that happens, then we will be in communion with him. We will be crying out mm-hmm. to him and we will see him work in our lives through his spirit and his grace. Mm-hmm. Yes. Very good. And, you know, as you're talking, I'm thinking about, and I always bring it up, like, you know, what's going on with the pastor's you know, sometimes the pastors are getting tempted and, and adultery is a big part of your book as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Big time. You know, um, that, that is one of the problems, you know, so, so let me say this, first of all, for, for just men in general, there is sometimes this perspective of, I can't help it. Right. I just can't, I, I've tried. It's just, it's too, too much. I can't overcome it. And I often give this challenge. I say to men, look, if, if Elon Musk, the richest man in the world, were to say, hey, I'm going to give $100 million to you if you can go six months without looking at pornography once. Okay, now look, I tell men this. It's impossible that a man will never have a flash of lust. In other words, they're going through their day and a a beautiful woman catches their eye or an image pops into their mind. That's different than indulging in pornography, which is a process. Because to do that, you have to make a decision in your mind. You got to go, you got to sit down at your computer, you got to take your phone, you got to open it up, open the browser, put in a search word, go on the site, scroll, search. That's a process. And and I tell men, it is possible for you to never look at pornography again, without question. 
I'll never see, I'll never have a flash of lust, but it's possible for you to never look at pornography again. So if Elon Musk said $100 million for any man who goes six months without looking at pornography, actively going and intentionally looking at pornography, $100 million. Nancy, you and I know that many, (laughs) I would venture to say every single man who was seriously given that challenge would go six months without looking at pornography. So it (laughs) it shows that it's not that we can't, it's that we won't. And why won't we? It's, it's an issue of value. I love mm-hmm. this saying that says value impacts behavior. Mm-hmm. It really does. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if I drop a penny on the ground, there are times I won't give it the time of day to stoop down and pick it up. I never do that with a hundred dollar bill, <laughs> right? Exactly. Why? Because I understand its value. If the government suddenly switched those values and that hundred dollar bill became worth a penny and that penny became worth a hundred dollars, you can be sure that, that my behavior would change. First, I'd weave buckets of tears over all the pennies I didn't pick up because I'd be a millionaire by now. And then I'd start using the $100 bill as a scrap piece of paper or a napkin to my, wipe my hand with. Value impacts behavior. We have to reorient our value system so that it aligns with God's, with mm-hmm. his value system. And we need to have that, again, like I said, that eternal perspective. So it's not that we can't, it's that we won't. Now, as far as pastors go, like you mentioned, they're dropping like flies, Nancy. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, I it seems like every week we're hearing about another major pastor that's fallen. And even one recently, they were playing clips of him talking about how foolish it is to fall into sexual morality while he was fooling around. How, mm-hmm. how, how tragic. And the problem with pastors oftentimes who, who end up falling is that they deceive themselves into thinking that it can't happen to them. Mm-hmm. Listen, the strongest man in the Bible fell into sexual sin the wisest man in the Bible fell into sexual sin and the godliest man in the Bible fell into sexual sin. So as Bodhi Bauckham so eloquently says, if, if pastors think they can't fall into sexual sin, then they're saying in essence, they're stronger than Samson, wiser than Solomon and godlier than King David. Mm-hmm. And that's stupid, <laughs> plain <laughs> stupid. And so pastors need to get their guard up. And that's, that's why I'm so excited about the book. You know, there's a major pastors conference uh, that just committed to give out 5,200 copies of my book to every leader and pastor that's going to be in attendance. And I'm so excited about that because- Where is it? Where is it? Uh, it's uh, it's the Shepherds Conference, John MacArthur's uh, Shepherds Conference. <laughs> and, 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 you know, that that has been the big blessing to me is that, you know, the, the people that have endorsed the book, Pastor John MacArthur said, every man needs to help this excellent book offers- uh, uh, Ken Ham, who's the founder and CEO of Answers in Genesis, the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum, he wrote the foreword to the book. Uh, Ray Comfort endorsed it. Kirk Cameron endorsed it uh, and many others. And I was blown away by its success, Nancy, in that in its debut, when it was released, it, it, it came out as a number one new release in its category on Amazon and the number one bestseller in its category. And overall, of all books in general on Amazon, it was one of the top bestsellers. And so mm-hmm. it, what what that does is it shows that there is a desperation out there for men who want victory. And I'm, I'm, I'm humbled that the Lord allowed me to write the book. And I believe it has truth in it from God's word that can help give them that victory. You know, as you're saying this, I'm, I'm thinking while you're talking to what you are so passionate about this, mm. what drove you to write it? I mean, there must've been something that just Pushed you off the cliff. Yeah, I am passionate, Nancy. I, in fact, I feel like I can hardly contain myself right now because, <clears throat> again, like I said, it's such a massive issue. And in the preface of the book, I talk about how critics have often said there are, are two indispensable elements that are necessary for any book to be successful. The first is necessity. There has to be a need that needs to be addressed. And can we think of any greater necessity than, than sexual morality to be addressed? Because, it, again, it's ravaging men, it's ravaging kids, it's ravaging families, it's ravaging the church. And so, you know, as someone who pastored for many years and someone who's still a ministry leader, I I used to constantly have to counsel men on this. And even today, women saying my marriage is destroyed, my husband is, 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 you know, totally ensnared with this. Parents coming to me, my children are destroyed. So there's that necessity. And then there's that passion combined with it. That's the second element. And that's because I want to see men delivered from this. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, before I came to Christ as a teenager, I had been ensnared in this. And then the Lord set me free by his grace. But as a man, I still know the pull and the temptations. I'm bombarded every day by them. And mm-hmm. so I, I I want to see men find victory. And the, the Lord has directed me to different things in his word. And, and so the joy has been 
the response I've already been getting from men that have literally said, my life has been changed in this area by the book. And uh, there's no greater joy for me than that, than, than to see men set free and be able to truly have the impact that they're called to have in their families and in the world for God's yeah. glory. And you know, it's got to be tugging on some guy's heart right now. I mean, he yeah. must be thinking to himself, he's talking about me. He's, yeah. he's talking about me. And how how can I escape this? How can I yeah. escape? And Jesus is the only escape we know of. But the Amen. book is the book is such a great tool. Again, it's Fight Like a Man, a bold biblical mm. bi- uh, battle plan for personal purity. And um, you know, endorsed by by Ken Ham, uh, forward by Ken Ham, and um, endorsed by you know, John MacArthur, many people, uh, Ray Cuffert, who is your father in law. I understand. That's right. He <laughs> is my father. He is my father in law. What a lot of people don't know, Nancy, is that Ray is of Jewish descent. I'm from Lebanon originally. I'm from Arab descent, wow. and together we are proof that there can be peace between Jews and Arabs through Christ. Right. Amen. And if not that, at the very least, we're going to start a new mattress company called Easy Comfort and call yeah, it a day. <laughs> Perfect. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I'm glad you mentioned Jesus. He's at the center of it all. You know, in the book, I said, I like I said, I have those six C's to succeed. And they're, you know, they have alliterated sentences that go along with them. And the last one is Christ. And that alliterated sentence is seek the sweet savior for strength, satisfaction, and sympathetic support. Mm -hmm. Because the the mind-blowing thing for you men out there that are listening right now is that it tells us in Hebrews 4 that we don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. And it says, therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The Lord is looking at you, men, those of you that know the Lord who are watching right now, with sympathy, Mm -hmm. with compassion. He was tempted like you are. Obviously, Jesus didn't have pornography in his day and age, but he would have been tempted by lust, of course, in all points as we are yet without sin. He never sinned, but he sympathizes with your weaknesses. It tells us in Hebrews 2 that he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he can come to the aid of those who are tempted. He wants to come alongside you. He tells you, come boldly to my throne room of grace to receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And at the same time, we're also told that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We're told that we don't that he is our advocate. If any John says in, in 1 John, these things were written so that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. We're not supposed to sin, but if we do, he's our advocate. He comes alongside to help us, to cleanse us, to forgive us. And I love how Jesus described himself in quoting from the Old Testament. He said, a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not quench. How beautiful is that? A bruised reed that's just useless. This stick's good for nothing. No, he mends it and heals it. A a smoldering wick with just smoke coming out, just a, a, a small ember left. No, he fans it back into a flame. That's what he wants to do for you. But he has to be your source of strength and help. You must be desperate for him. And in the book, I talk about how Christ can do that for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now, again, I'm thinking about what you're saying here. What if a man is, um, you know, he loves his family. He's walking with God. All right. Maybe he's not walking with God, you know, because this is about temptation altogether, right? And, right? And the strength of God to get through the temptation. That temptation of that maybe woman that walks in front of him and just gives him the attention that his wife isn't giving him, you know, how do you, what do you say to that? How do you speak into that? Yeah. Well, again, it, it comes down to character as a man, right? This is where you fight. Look, if there's an issue in your, in your relationship with your wife and the, 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 flame has burned out, so to speak, you need to examine that. And what are you going to do as a leader to try to help fix that? See, that's the problem. Oftentimes there are problems in marriages and men are abdicating their duty, even if they're a part of the problem to help lead them out of that problem. Mm -hmm. And so you need to stand up and say, okay, what do we need? Do we need counseling as a couple? Mm -hmm. Do we need to sit down and have that earnest talk where I say, honey, I I sense there are issues in our marriage. And the, the issue is, is when you're satisfied in Christ, you're, you're, you're sustained, right? So in other words, when men aren't satisfied in Christ, they develop spiritual starvation. And you know, in the physical, Nancy, when people are deprived of their normal diet, they revert to substitution in places where there have been famines around the world. There was a, a rugby team years ago that crashed up in the Andes 
uh, it, there was a movie made on it. It was called Alive, a book written about it. These people ended up eating the passengers who had died in the crash after they exhausted all the food that was left on, on that crash plane. Who in the world would eat their friends? Who in the world would, would eat cockroaches and rats and bark off of trees and leaves as people do when they're in starvation? No one in their right mind. But starvation is an altered state of mind. It begins with deprivation. You're deprived of your normal diet. That leads to desperation where now you're willing to do something you wouldn't normally do. That leads to deviation where you actually do it, which leads to substitution. You start eating things you never would. And that mm -hmm. ultimately leads to deterioration. And mm -hmm. when Christ, who's the bread of life and the fountain of living water, is not your source of satisfaction, the cravings will intensify. You'll revert to substitution in the physical. And now even your wife isn't satisfying enough. So you'll end up veering. So you make sure your relationship with the Lord is right. Then you work on fixing your relationship with your wife. And in any case, you stay faithful to the Lord. What do you do if you're a single man and a woman's giving you attention? You're not supposed to fornicate, right? You're supposed to honor the Lord and do what's right. And Christ is your general source and sense of satisfaction in all things. And you remain eternally minded as well. Nancy, you're getting me excited here. Sorry, I'm just <laughs> preaching sermons. <laughs> Amen. I love, I love the preaching part. I love the preaching yeah. part. You know, so if if one if if readers take one thing from Fight Like a Man, what should it be? Yeah, it's it's uh, again that uh, you're in a real battle. You need to equip yourself to fight like a soldier. Jesus needs to be at the center of it. And let me finish with this, Nancy. You need to be fueled by love. You know that the last section is called Six C's and a Nope. Right, the Six C's to succeed and a Nope. And this is a principle that I try to teach men. And, you know, one day I was counseling a young man and, uh, you know, he had been having different struggles. I said, how are you doing with pornography? He said, oh, I'm doing pretty good. I said, how are you doing with lust? You know, as you go about your day, and you see beautiful women or images pop in your mind. How are you doing with that? And he hung his head kind of in, in shame and in discouragement. He said, you know, I'm not doing too well. And at that moment, Nancy, I felt this zeal for righteousness and purity rise up in me as I considered how men are just being ravaged again in this regard. I mm -hmm. said, brother, you know what? We just need to, we need to be determined to fight this. We need to just have this attitude where we say, nope, enough is enough. I'm not doing this. Nope. I said, in fact, we need to say nope out loud. Like, you know, that commits us, you know, anyhow, I sensed it really resonated with him and it really resonated with me, you know, and it, I don't know something distinct was happening in my heart through it. And so I, I, I go home the next day I'm leaving for the office. I get in my car, I'm driving and these, these two young ladies come jogging by my car, wearing hardly anything. And I caught a glimpse of them in my periphery and, and instinctively I just caught myself going, nope, out loud. <laughs> then I thought, you know, I wish there was some kind of acrostic that, could tie in with, with that word nope that, that would have meaning and it could help men. And as soon as I thought that, the words popped into my mind, nope, N-O-P-E, not one peak even, not oh. one peak even. Oh. <laughs> and, and you know what? It, it just, it, I thought, wow, it excited me. And I, I shared it because, you know, nope is different than nope. If someone says to you, hey, can you do this for me? And you say, no, it's one thing. But if you go, nope, it's like, whoa, she means it. That's attitude, you know? <laughs> and I tell men to say it out loud because, again, it commits them. You know, even if, if people are around, say it under your breath. Nope. And, and, and after a while, it becomes muscle memory and it becomes default. A thought pops in your mind, an image catches your eye. Nope, not with my mind's eye, not with my physical eye. And then I thought, you know, why nope, though? Why not one peak even? Because it's fueled by love. Yeah. And it's primarily by five things that I love. And, and as I say, nope, I envision my hand reaching out to take a hold of the plow. Remember, Jesus said, if anyone puts his hand to the plow and looks back, he's not fit for the kingdom. And in essence, when we're giving in to lust, that's what we're doing. We're, we're saying, yep, Jesus, I belong to you. I'm walking with you. I'm, I'm going forward in the kingdom. And, and, and we're looking back at lustful images. And, and that's terrible. So I envision each one of these loves as one of my fingers. And as I say, each one, each one is wrapping around the handle of, uh, of the plow. And I'm moving forward. And so it says, why not one peak even? Because I love my Lord, the one who paid the highest price to redeem me. I love my lady, the woman that I made vows before heaven and earth to be faithful to. I love my lineage, my children, grandchildren, even my, my you know, parents and those that went before me who I represent. I love his uh, lambs. I love God's children, those that I'm called to be an example to and encourage and build up. And I love the lost those that I'm called to be a witness to with the gospel of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so I say, nope, not one peak even. Why? Because I love my Lord. I love my lady. I love my lineage. I love his lambs. I love the lost. Nope, not one peak even. So that's mm -hmm. one of the tools as an example that I give men in the book. 
I love it. Amen. And you know, when you're saying that, you know, don't look back, I'm thinking Sodom. Sodom. <laughs> exactly. Remember, <laughs> Jesus said, right? Remember Lot's wife. Yeah. And in a sense, that's what we're doing. We're longing back for the wicked, filthy, fleshly ways of the world. Yeah. And when you consider the treasures that we have in Christ, the eternal bliss that, that, that he supplies, the, the joy, the freedom, the, the strength that comes from walking a life uh, of obedience and surrender to him. It's, yes. it's glorious. You know, C.S. Lewis talked about how, you know, when people exchange obedience to the Lord and a life of spiritual vibrancy, in essence, it's like a child being content with making mud pies in the slum when he can be having a holiday at the sea. And so, we, you know, we need to, we need to remember that. Amen. And, you know, um, you can find Emil's book, Fight Like a Man. And um, it's, it's such a great book, a bold b- biblical battle plan for personal purity. And um, you can find it on Broad Street Publishing and Amazon.com. And, yeah. um, and you can find... Um, Emil, or he says EZ, right? EZ. <laughs> yeah, the initials. That's right. Uh, yeah, on, uh, on social media, right? So right, that's right. Yeah, I'd love to connect with you. And um, uh, please just get the book and let the Lord minister to your heart through it. Amen. And what would you like to leave my audience with today? Well, Nancy, I'd love to leave them with, with that encouragement that uh, eternity is coming. And we need to prize Jesus. We need to treasure him. We need to recognize that uh, in him, we live, we breathe, we, we have our very being. And that when you are satisfied in him, everything changes, everything changes. And you're able to find grace and strength. Uh, and look, he, he will be with us always, even unto the end of the age. He will never leave us nor forsake us. And I love the saying that says, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And, you know, everything minus Jesus equals nothing. So remember that and make him your all in all. What if the breakthrough you've been waiting for in your struggle with temptation starts by surrendering fully to God's grace today? Thanks for joining. And if you like this interview, like and subscribe for more Christ-centered conversations and check out the website, thecallwithnancycebedo.com to find out more about our previous guests. Until next time, all glory and honor to King Jesus.